Hello and welcome back. In today's video, I'm overclocking the Intel Xeon W72495X Sapphire Rapid CPU all the way up to 5.2 gigahertz using the Asus Pro WSW790ACE motherboard and EK Pro Custom Loop water cooling. This is the first time that I'll overclock a Xeon CPU, and it's of course the first time that I'm overclocking this Sapphire Rapids architecture. Now, I didn't have too much time to dig too deep into this CPU, so consider this more as a layman's approach to overclocking the Sapphire Rapids CPUs. All right, we have a lot to cover, so let's get started. The Intel Xeon W7-2495X is part of Intel's fourth generation Xeon scalable processors, formerly known as Sapphire Rapids 112L and Sapphire Rapids 64L. Sapphire Rapids is the successor to, well, a variety of architectures. On the 4S8S server side, it's the successor to the 2020 40 nanometer Cooper Lake. On the 1S2S server and workstation side, it's the successor to the 2021 10 nanometer Ice Lake. And on the high-end desktop side, it's the successor to the 2019 40 nanometer Cascade Lake. Enthusiasts like myself can think of the Sapphire Rapids W790 platform as the successor of the overclockable Cascade Lake X and locked Cascade Lake W processors. But perhaps the real spiritual predecessor of the unlocked Xeon W2400 and W3400 series is the overclockable 28-core Xeon W3175X launched in 2018. Intel spoke at length about the Sapphire Rapids architecture during their architecture day in 2021. So I won't go over the details of this architecture. Suffice to say there are quite a bit of improvements compared to Ice Lake, Cooper Lake and Cascade Lake. The most significant improvements are the Intel 7 process technology and up to 56 Golden Cove P cores. That makes Alder Lake the equivalent on mainstream desktop. It also features PCIe 5.0, DDR5 EEC RDIMM support, and Intel's third generation deep learning boost technology. Lastly, Sapphire Rapids transitions from a single monolithic die design to a multi tile design for increased scalability. Well, sort of. The multi tile die design is used for the Xeon W3400 series, however, the Xeon W2400 segment still features a monolithic die. And that's not where the differences between the W2400 and W3400 ends. While the W3400 series go up to 56 P cores, the W2400 only goes up to 24 P cores. The W3400 series supports 8 channel memory, whereas the W2400 series only supports quad channel memory. The W3400 series also support 112 PCIe 5.0 lanes, whereas the W2400 series only support up to 64 lanes. The Sapphire Rapids Xeon W processors are further segmented according to Xeon W3, W5, W7 and W9 brands. That's similar to how we have Core i3 to Core i9 on the mainstream desktop. Xeon W9 is reserved exclusively for the W3400 series and you can only find Xeon W3 processors in the Xeon W2400 product line. Xeon W5 and W7 are available in both series. Across all Sapphire Rapids workstation products, eight overclockable SKUs are split evenly between the W2400 and W3400 segments. We'll get back to how overclocking is enabled later in this video. It suffice to say that the Xeon W72495X we're overclocking in this video is a top SKU in the W2400 lineup. The Xeon W7-2495X has 24 P cores with 48 threads. The Turbo Boost 2.0 boost frequency is 4.6 GHz and the Turbo Boost Max 3.0 boost frequency is 4.8 GHz. The maximum boost frequency gradually decreases from 4.8 GHz for up to 2 active P cores to 3.3 GHz when all P cores are active. The base TDP is 225 watt and the turbo TDP is 270 watts. The TJ Max is 94 degrees Celsius. In this video, we're covering four different overclocking strategies. First, we rely on Asus MCE and Intel XMP performance boost technologies. 
Second, we use Asus's water-cooled OC preset. Third, we try a static manual overclock. And lastly, we go for a dynamic manual overclock. But before we jump into the overclocking, let's first have a look at the hardware and the benchmarks that we'll be using in this guide. The system we're overclocking today consists of the following hardware. The W790 ACE motherboard is a one of two ASUS motherboards available for Sapphire Rapids, the other one being the W790E Sage. A primary difference between the two boards is the memory architecture slots, as the ACE model supports quad-channel memory, whereas the Sage model supports up to eight-channel memory. That aligns with the W2400 and W3400 CPU segmentation where the former supports quad-channel and the latter supports 8-channel memory. Note that the ACE still supports W3400 CPUs, it's just that they'll run with quad-channel memory. Another difference relevant to performance tuning is that the ACE has a 12 plus 1 plus 1 power phase, whereas the SAGE has 14 plus 1 plus 1. The Easy Fan Controller Scatterbencher Edition is essentially a customized version of Elmo Labs' EFC. So it's a collaboration between Elmo Labs and Scatterbencher. I explained how I use the EFC SB in a separate video on this channel. By connecting the EFC SB to the EVC2 device, I monitor the ambient temperature, water temperature, and fan duty cycle. I include the measurements in my Prime95 stability test results. I also use the Elmo Labs EFC SB to map the radiator fan curve to the water temperature. Without going into too many details, I've attached an external temperature sensor from the water in the loop to the EFC SB. Then I use the low high setting to map the fan curve from 25 to 40 degrees water temperature. I use this configuration for all my overclocking strategies. The main takeaway from this configuration is that it gives us a good indicator of whether the cooling is saturated. We use Windows 11 and the following benchmark applications to measure performance and ensure system stability. Before we start overclocking, of course, we have to check the performance at stock settings. Please note that out of the box, this motherboard unleashes the Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits. So for us to check the performance at stock settings, we first have to go into the BIOS and go to the AI Tweaker menu, set ACES multi-core enhancement to disabled and force all limits then save and exit the BIOS. The default Turbo Boost 2.0 parameters for the Xeon W724-95X are as follows. Here's the benchmark performance at stock. Here are the 3 d Mark CPU profile scores at stock. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 2519 MHz with 0.788 volts. The average CPU temperature is 36 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 24 and 26.7 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 224.9 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 2823 MHz with 0.824 volts. The average CPU temperature is 36 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 23.3 and 26.3 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 224.9 watts. Now let us try our first overclocking strategy, but before that, make sure to locate the CMOS clear button. Pressing the clear CMOS button will reset all your BIOS settings to default, which is helpful if you want to start your BIOS configuration from scratch. However, it does not delete any of the BIOS profiles previously saved. The clear CMOS button is located on the rear IO panel. In our first overclocking strategy, we make use of ASUS multi-core enhancement to unleash the Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits, as well as we use Intel Extreme Memory Profile 3.0. Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 is an Intel technology that lets you run the processor faster than the base specifications if the processor is running within the power, current, and thermal limits. The ultimate advantage is opportunistic performance enhancements in both single-threaded as well as multi-threaded workloads. The Turbo Boost algorithm works according to a proprietary EWMA formula. This stands for Exponentially Weighed Moving Average. There are three parameters to consider, PL1, PL2, and TAL. Turbo Boost 2.0 technology is available on Sapphire Rapids as it's the primary driver of performance over the base frequency. An easy ASUS multi-core enhancement option on ASUS motherboards allows you to unleash the Turbo Boost power limits. 
set the option to enabled remove all limits and enjoy maximum performance. Adjusting the power limits is strictly speaking not considered overclocking and that's because we change none of the frequency, voltage or thermal parameters. Intel provides the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits as guidance to motherboard makers and system integrators to ensure that their designs can run the CPU at the base performance. But of course, as we know, better motherboard designs, better thermal solutions and better system designs can enable peak performance for a more sustained period of time. Intel Extreme Memory Profile is an Intel technology that lets you automatically overclock your system memory with the objective of higher system performance. It is based on the JDEC standard and allows memory vendors such as G-Skill to program higher performance configurations onto the memory sticks. Intel Extreme Memory Profile 3.0 is the new XMP standard for DDR5 memory. It is primarily based on the XMP 2.0 standard for DDR4, but has additional functionality. While initially intended for DDR5 DIMM, XMP 3.0 is also compatible with DDR5 RDIMM. The difference between DIMM and RDIMM, or Registered Dual Inline Memory Module, is that the latter has a register between the DRAM modules and the system's memory controller. This buffer reduces the electrical load on the memory controller and thus allows stability with more memory modules. There's a lot more to the new XMP 3.0 standard, which is outside of the scope of this overclocking guide. Check out my Alder Lake launch video for more details about XMP 3.0. XMP 3.0 works surprisingly well on the Sapphire Rapids platform. However, unfortunately, even though my kit is rated at DDR5-6800, I was only able to run it stably in Y-Cruncher at DDR5-6600. So I had to drop the memory ratio by two steps. But we're still taking advantage of the XMP timings because we'll be enabling XMP. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP1. Set ASUS Multi-Core Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Set DRAM Frequency to DDR5-6600. Then save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. After unleashing the Turbo Boost Ratio 2.0 power limits and enabling Extreme Memory Profile, the performance improves noticeably but not spectacularly. The most significant performance improvements are in memory sensitive workloads, which benefit from overclocking the memory from DDR5 4800 to DDR5 6600. We see the highest performance improvement of plus 13.97% in Y Cruncher. We don't see a more significant impact from unleashing the Turbo Boost power limits because we're frequency limited. The standard frequency for an all core workload is only 3.3 GHz. So the frequency won't boost beyond that, despite unleashing the power limit. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 2,993 MHz with 0.845 volts. The average CPU temperature is 44 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 24.6 and 27.7 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 305.6 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 3093 MHz with 0.855 volts. The average CPU temperature is 41 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 24.6 and 27.1 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 265.3 watts. In our second overclocking strategy, we make use of ASUS's water-cooled OC preset option in the BIOS. The water-cooled OC preset option in the BIOS is really a great addition to the ASUS Pro WSW790 motherboards, as it gives Xeon customers a very easy path to extra performance. The preset can be enabled with the click of a single button and drastically improves the all-core performance by changing the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratio configuration. On this Xeon W7-2495X, for example, by enabling the preset, the all-core frequency increases by more than 1 GHz, from 3.3 GHz to 4.4 GHz. Most importantly, it does that without increasing the CPU core voltage. How's that possible, I hear you ask? 
Well, the Turbo Boost 2.0 configuration allows any of the 24 cores to boost up to 4.6 GHz when up to 4 cores are active. This configuration also means that every core inside the CPU has a factory-fused voltage frequency curve up to 4.6 GHz. In other words, Intel has defined the voltage needed to run at 4.6 GHz. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP1. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enable to Remove All Limits. Set CPU Core Ratio to Water Cooled OC Preset. Set DRAM Frequency to DDR5 6600. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. By enabling the Water Cooled OC Preset, we significantly increase the All Core Frequency. That greatly improved performance as we also unleashed the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits. We see a maximum performance improvement of plus 45.43% in Blender Classroom. When running Prime 95, small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4373 MHz with 1.123 volts. The average CPU temperature is 93 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 25.6 and 31.9 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 649.7 watts. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4390 MHz with 1.104 volts. The average CPU temperature is 77 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 24.4 and 29.8 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 483.6 watts. In our third overclocking strategy, we are pursuing a manual fixed overclock. Now, I'm not known for advocating for this kind of a traditional approach to overclocking, especially on mainstream platforms. And that's because I feel that generally you lose out on too much performance headroom in single threaded or light workloads. But for this platform, for Sapphire Rapids, I wanted to give it another shot. Before I show you my BIOS settings, I think it's important that we have a look at the Sapphire Rapids clocking and voltage topology to better understand how overclocking on this CPU will work. Now, there's not that much information available on the clocking and voltage topology for Sapphire Rapids, so most of the information is by my own testing, as well as some help from the ACES overclocking team. The clocking of Sapphire Rapids is a little bit different than what we're used to. What we would expect is that the PCH or the chipset generates all the clock frequencies for the entire motherboard and then there's an alternative with an external clock generator. While Sapphire Rapids should support a 25 megahertz crystal input to the PCH and then the PCH generating all the rest of the clocks, that's not the standard mode of architecture for Sapphire Rapids. And actually, it's not even officially supported. The supported clocking topology relies on a 25 MHz crystal or crystal oscillator input to an external CK440Q clock generator, which then connects to one or more DB2000Q differential buffer devices. The platform supports multiple clocking topologies, balanced and unbalanced. The specific implementation for your system will ultimately depend on your motherboard choice. In an ideal world, we would separate the CPU BCLK from any of the PCIe clocks, but it seems that this kind of a configuration isn't really working that well with Sapphire Rapids. So more likely than not, your motherboard will have an architecture where the CPU BCLK is linked to the PCIe clocks. So when you're overclocking the CPU BCLK, you're also going to be overclocking the PCIe frequency. The 100 MHz CPU BCLK is then multiplied with specific ratios for each of the different parts in the CPU. Each P-core can run at its own independent frequency. The maximum CPU ratio is 120x. However, the maximum all-core ratio is limited to 52x on multi-tile die CPUs. I'll get back to that in a minute. The mesh PLL ties together the last level cache, cache box, and seemingly also the memory controller. It can run an independent frequency from the P-cores. On monolithic dies of the W2400 processors, the mesh ratio is limited to 80x. However, on the multi-tile dies of the W3400 processors, the mesh ratio is limited to 27. 
The memory frequency is also driven by the CPU BCLK and multiplied by a memory ratio. The memory ratio goes up to 88x or a frequency of up to DDR5-8800. There are a couple of notable oddities when it comes to CPU core clocking on Sapphire Rapids. While the per core maximum ratio is 120x, the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratio limit for one active core is 117x. On multi tile die Sapphire Rapids variants, the Turbo Boost 2.0 all core maximum allowed CPU ratio is 52x. Effectively, you must increase the BCLK frequency with the 52x maximum ratio to break all core world records. This all core ratio limit is not present on the monolithic die variants. The CPU has similar FLLOC issues as on early Alder Lake platforms. In short, a bug appears to allow a ratio to be programmed to the CPU PLL, even though the actual effective frequency is lower. This may cause you to see reported frequency much higher than reasonable. However, the CPU performance in benchmark applications isn't affected, so the benchmark performance will reflect the real effective frequency. Building on the previous point, specific CPU cores appear to have different points at which the FLL bug occurs. So for record chasing attempts, you may try to find the cores in your CPU with the highest FLL range and only use those for benchmarking. For the extreme overclockers out there, Sapphire Rapids seems to be cold bugging somewhere between minus 90 and minus 120 degrees Celsius, most likely due to the fiber. Sapphire Rapids is using a combination of fully integrated voltage regulators or fiber and motherboard voltage regulators or MBVRs for power management. There are eight distinct voltage inputs to a Sapphire Rapids processor. Most of these inputs power a fiber. The fiber then manages the voltage provided to specific parts of the CPU. Some of these voltages can be controlled by the end user. Unfortunately, it's not entirely clear which fibers are powering the end user configurable power domains. I tried my best to put together the information and assemble something that I think is reasonable, but bear in mind that what I'm about to show you may not be entirely accurate. VCCN is the primary power source for the CPU. The default voltage is 1.8 volt. Through Intel's overclocking toolkit, we have access of up to 57 power domains. VCC core provides the voltage to up to 56 individual P cores. VCC mesh provides the voltage to the mesh and last level cache. VCC INFAON provides the input power for those parts of the CPU that should always be on. INF stands for infrastructure and AON stands for always on. The power domains include the fibers needed for initializing the CPU during boot up. The default voltage is one volt. VCC FA EHV provides the input power for the PCIe 5.0, UPI IO and all other fiber power domains. The default voltage is one volt. Through Intel's overclocking toolkit, we have access to two power domains. VCC CFN provides the power for the on die coherent fabric, or CF, which provides the means of communication between the various components inside the die or tile. Each module on the die, whether that's the core, memory controller, I.O. or accelerator, contains an agent providing access to the CF. The default voltage is 0.7 volt. MCC MDFI provides the power for the multi-die fabric interconnect, which extends the coherent fabric across multiple dies. The default voltage is 0.5 volt. VCC FA EHV Fiber A provides the input power for the analog I.O. fiber domains and the core power for the on-package HBM in Sapphire Rapids SKUs with HBM. The default voltage is 1.8 volt. Through Intel's overclocking toolkit, we have access to two power domains. VCC IO provides the power for all IO modules on the die. The default voltage is one volt. VCC MDFIA provides the power for the analog parts of the multi-die fabric interconnect. The default voltage is 0.9 volt. VCC DHV provides the power source for the DDR5 memory controllers. These voltages are not shared with the DDR5 memory. The default voltage is 1.1 volt. Through Intel's overclocking toolkit, we have access to two power domains. 
VCC DDRD, possibly the memory controller core voltage, which defaults at 0.7 volt, and VCC DDRA, possibly the memory controller side IO voltage, which defaults at 0.9 volt. VNN provides the power for the CPU GPU IO and on package devices. The default voltage is 1 volt. 3V3 Oaks provides the power for some on package devices such as the Pyrom. The default voltage is 3.3 volt. VPP HBM provides the charge pump voltage for the on package HBM on Sapphire Rapid CPUs with HBM. The default voltage is 2.5 volt. I want to make a couple of extra notes regarding overclocking, specifically this Xeon W7 2495X. Since the 2495X sports the monolithic die, any multi die fabric interconnect voltages are irrelevant. For 2495X overclocking, the only relevant voltages are those connected to the VCC IN fiber, including the P core and mesh voltages, and, to a lesser extent, the VCC CFN voltage for the coherent fabric and VCC D voltage for the DDR5 memory controller. The VCC IN is really the only voltage rail requiring some tuning, as Sapphire Rapids can draw a lot of power. The fine tuning practice is to increase the VCC in voltage from 1.8 volt to 2.2 or 2.3 volt to help the VRM deal with high loads. After all, high power with low voltage requires a high current, which is particularly stressful for the VRM. In this strategy, we're pursuing a very traditional CPU overclock, which means one ratio and one voltage for all of the cores. The main constraint in this type of overclocking strategy is going to be our worst case scenario. In this overclocking strategy, that's Prime 95, smaller 50s with AVX2 enabled. This may surprise some of you as we'd expect the AVX 512 workload to be heavier. But as you can see from this table, AVX2 produces a higher CPU package power with a higher CPU temperature. The main limiting factor for the maximum frequency is not the core's overclocking capabilities, but the maximum voltage we can use in our worst case scenario workload. The maximum allowed temperature for Sapphire Rapid CPUs is 94 degrees Celsius. With the water-cooled OC preset, we already reached that temperature in the Prime95 AVX2 test. As you know, power scales exponentially with operating voltage. For example, a 10% increase in voltage on this CPU increases power consumption by about 21%. Ultimately, the operating voltage is the main limiting factor for our maximum frequency. I found that for this CPU, the maximum voltage in our worst case scenario workload is about 1.15 volt. And with that voltage, I can increase the CPU frequency to about 4.8 gigahertz. While that's the same frequency at stock for when up to two cores are active, it's a whopping 1.5 gigahertz higher when all cores are active. In addition to that, we also slightly bump up the VCC in voltage from 1.8 volt to 2.2 volt to make it a little bit easier on the VRMs. Basically, for a certain amount of power, if we increase our voltage, then our VRMs will draw a lower current, and that makes it easier for the VRM. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to XMP1. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enable to Remove All Limits. Set CPU Core Ratio to By Core Usage. Enter the By Core Usage submenu. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 1 to 48. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 1 to 24. Leave the By Core Usage submenu. Set DRAM Frequency to DDR5-6600. Set vCore 1.8V in to Manual Mode. Set CPU Core Voltage Override to 2.2. Set global core ISBIT voltage to manual mode. Set CPU core voltage override to 1.15. Then save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. Running the Xeon W7 2495X at fixed 4.8 GHz is the equivalent of how MCE used to work. We set every core to the maximum default CPU ratio. In the default specification, only two cores can boost to 4.8 GHz. In our overclock, every core can boost to that frequency. Furthermore, we've increased the frequency by a whopping 1.5 GHz in all core workloads. So, naturally, we'd expect a significant performance improvement.
we get a maximum performance improvement of plus 59.48% in Cinebench R23. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4089 MHz with 1.154 volts. The average CPU temperature is 93 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.4 and 32.5 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 644.7 watts. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4794 MHz with 1.154 volts. The average CPU temperature is 91 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 25.4 and 31.1 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 581.8 watts. In our final overclocking strategy, we pursue a modern manual dynamic overclock. To explain how we're going to do that, we first have to talk about Sapphire Rapids OC Toolkit. I dug into the detailed history of Intel's overclocking toolkit when I talked about Alder Lake non-K overclocking. Long story short, Intel has developed and maintained what they call an OC mailbox, and that contains all the tools of their overclocking toolkit. Now, the toolkit isn't the same across all of the architectures, because on some CPUs, we need different tools. On Sapphire Rapids, the overclocking toolkit consists of the following tools. Notably missing from the OC toolbox are prominent features we know from mainstream desktop, like advanced voltage offset, better known as the VF points, and overclocking thermal velocity boost, or OCTVB. We all know the Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 technology from its impact on the power limits, but a second, very important aspect of Turbo Boost 2.0 is the ability to configure a CPU frequency based on the number of active cores. Turbo Boost 2.0 ratio configuration allows us to configure the overclock for different scenarios ranging from one active core to all active cores. Intel provides eight registers to configure the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratios. On mainstream platforms where the top SKU has no more than eight P cores, typically these registers are configured by the motherboard from one active P core to eight active P cores. However, on platforms with core counts beyond eight cores, we can configure each register by target turbo boost ratio and number of active cores. For example, the standard and ASUS water-cooled OC preset turbo boost ratio configuration for the Xeon W72495X is as follows. Note that bi-core usage doesn't mean that we're configuring each core individually. Bi-core usage means that we're making an overclock based on the actual usage. When a workload uses, for example, four cores, it's still up to the CPU to determine which four cores are going to be activated. While we only recently saw per core ratio control on mainstream desktops, that was on Rocket Lake, the feature has been present on high-end desktop since Broadwell E in 2016. The per core ratio and voltage control options let you control the upper end of the voltage frequency curve of each core inside your CPU. While the general rules of adaptive voltage mode still apply, this enables two crucial new avenues for CPU overclocking. First, it allows users to individually overclock each core and find its maximum stable frequency. Second, it allows users to set an aggressive bi-core usage overclock while constraining the worst cores. Since each core has its own fiber regulated power rail, it's possible to fine tune each core to its maximum capability. We'll cover how this tuning works when discussing adaptive voltage mode. Intel first introduced AVX negative ratio offset on Broadwell E in 2016. Successive architectures then had this feature expanded with an AVX2 and an AVX512 ratio offset. And now on Sapphire Rapids, we have another negative ratio offset. TMO ratio offset. TMO stands for Tile Matrix Multiply and is an Intel Advanced Matrix Extensions Technology component. It's designed to accelerate AI and deep learning workloads. The ratio offsets help achieve maximum performance for SSE, AVX, and AMX workloads. The four frequency levels are L0 to L3. Each level is associated with particular instructions ranging from the lightest to the heaviest. Each level can also be associated with one specific ratio offset. 
As a rule, the ratio offset configured for a given frequency license must be equal to or higher than the preceding frequency license. In other words, L0, which equals 0, is smaller than L1, which is smaller than L2, and that is smaller than L3. Since Ice Lake, the ratio offset is applied on a per core basis. The ratio offset is subtracted from the core specific ratio limit, but is still subject to the other turbo boost ratio configuration rules. I didn't have sufficient time yet to look into the specific behavior of these ratio offsets on Sapphire Rapids. So I'll have to dig into that topic in a future video. Just like any previous Intel architecture, there are two ways to configure the voltage for Sapphire Rapid CPU cores, override mode and adaptive mode. Override mode specifies a single static voltage across all ratios. It is mainly used for extreme overclocking where stability at high frequencies is the only consideration. Adaptive mode is the standard mode of operation. In adaptive mode, the CPU relies on the factory fused voltage frequency curves to set the appropriate voltage for a given ratio. When configuring an adaptive voltage, it is mapped against the OC ratio, the highest configured ratio. We'll get back to that in a minute. Since Sapphire Rapids uses Fiverr, we can only adjust the core voltages by configuring the CPU PCU via BIOS or specialized tools like XTU. We can specify a voltage offset for override and adaptive modes. Of course, this doesn't make much sense for override mode. If you set 1.15 volt with a plus 50 millivolt offset, you might as well set 1.2 volt. But it can be helpful in adaptive mode as you can offset the entire VF curve by up to 500 millivolt in both directions. On Sapphire Rapids, you can configure override and adaptive mode both on a global and a per core level. Let's first have a look at how adaptive voltage mode works on a single core. When we set an adaptive voltage for a core, this voltage is mapped against the OC ratio. The OC ratio is the highest ratio configured for the CPU. When you leave everything at default, the OC ratio is determined by the maximum turbo ratio. In the case of the W724-95X, that ratio would be 48X because of the Turbo Boost Max 3.0. The OC ratio equals the highest configured ratio if you overclock. Specific rules govern what adaptive voltage can be set. A voltage set for a given ratio n must be higher than or equal to the voltage set for ratio n minus 1. Suppose our 2495X runs 48X at 1.25 volt. In that case, setting the adaptive voltage mapped to 48X lower than 1.25 volt is pointless. 48X always runs at 1.25 volt or higher. Biases may allow you to configure lower values. However, the CPU's internal mechanisms will override your configuration if it doesn't follow the rules. The adaptive voltage configured for any ratio below the maximum default turbo ratio will be ignored. Take the same example of the 2495X specified to run 48X at 1.25 volt. If you try to configure all cores to 45x and set 1.1 volt, the CPU will ignore this because it has its own factory fused target voltage for all ratios up to 48x and will use this voltage. You can only change the voltage of the OC ratio, which as mentioned before, on the 2495x is 48x and up. For ratios between the OC ratio and the next highest factory fused VF point, the voltage is interpolated between the set adaptive voltage and the factory fused voltage. Returning to our example of the 2495X specified to run 48X at 1.25 volt, let's say we manually configure the OC ratio to be 52X at 1.35 volt. The target voltage for ratios 51X, 50X and 49X will now be interpolated between 1.25 volt and 1.35 volt. As I mentioned already, we can do this for each core individually. However, that would be rather painful, especially on a 56 core CPU. Fortunately, there's also an alternative way to set a global adaptive voltage. When we set a global adaptive voltage, it maps this voltage to the OC ratio for each core in our CPU. So if our OC ratio is 52X and the global adaptive voltage is 1.35 volt, then every core in our CPU has a voltage frequency curve 
that goes up to 52x at 1.35 volt. That certainly makes things easier. One last note, we can also configure a per core ratio limit. Counterintuitively, this ratio doesn't act as a core specific OC ratio, but as a means to limit what parts of the VF curve can be used. Let's take that same example of the 52X at 1.35 volt. If we set the per core ratio limit to 51X, the CPU core will boost up to 5.1 gigahertz at a voltage interpolated between 52X at 1.35 volt and 48X at 1.25 volt. In this OC strategy, I'm relying on a global adaptive voltage offset. I found the offset help me gain better stability in transient loads. So going from light workloads to really heavy workloads. With the additional voltage headroom, I increased some cores to 5.2 gigahertz, while others had to stay around five gigahertz. That's still about 400 megahertz higher than stock. Unfortunately, I also had to configure an AVX2, AVX512 and AMX ratio offset of 4X to ensure stability in those workloads. Furthermore, I was able to increase the all core frequency to 4.9 gigahertz. That means we're now 1.6 gigahertz higher than the stock all core frequency. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI tweaker menu. Set AI overclock tuner to XMP1. Set ASUS multi-core enhancement to enabled remove all limits. Set CPU core ratio to by core usage. Enter the by core usage submenu. Set turbo ratio limit one to 52. Set turbo ratio cores one to eight. Set turbo ratio limit two to 51. Set turbo ratio cores two to 12. Set turbo ratio limit three to 50. Set turbo ratio cores three to 16. Set turbo ratio limit four to 49. Set turbo ratio cores four to 24. Leave the by core usage submenu. Enter the specific core submenu. Set core 0, 1, 6, 18, and 21 specific ratio limit to 50. Set core 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 19 specific ratio limit to 51. Set core 7, 8, 11, 20, 22, and 23 specific ratio limit to 52. Leave the specific core submenu. Set DRAM frequency to DDR5-6600. Enter the AVX related controls submenu. Set AVX2, AVX512, and TML ratio offset to per core ratio limit to user specify. Set AVX2, AVX512, and TML ratio offset to 4. Leave the AVX related controls submenu. Enter the DigiPlus VRM submenu. Set CPU current capability to 140%. Leave the DG plus VRM submenu. Set vCore 1.8 volt in to manual mode. Set CPU core voltage override to 2.3. Set global core ISVID voltage to adaptive mode. Set offset mode sign to plus. Set offset voltage to 0.1. Then save and exit the BIOS. We rerun the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. Usually changing to a dynamic overclock means making fewer performance compromises as we can tune for a light load and high load scenarios. On Sapphire Rapids, that's not the case because of the limited tuning toolkit. So while our dynamic overclock helps boost the performance in light and few threaded workloads, we must compromise the performance in heavy or all core workloads. Of course, the performance is still well beyond stock, but in some benchmarks, it's not as high as with a fixed overclock. We get the highest performance improvement of plus 53.58% in Blender Classroom. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4092 MHz with 1.162 volts. The average CPU temperature is 93 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 27.5 and 33.4 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 633.8 watts. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4,469 MHz with 1.221 volts. The average CPU temperature is 93 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.4 and 32.4 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 598.4 watts. All right, let's wrap this up. To be honest, the first thing I want to mention is that I'm absolutely delighted that there are no less than eight 
overclockable SKUs for Sapphire Rapids. When I first heard that there would be a return of overclockable Xeons, I figured Intel will probably do the same like they did with the W3175X CPU, one Halo SKU. The fact that they have come out with four W2400 and four W3400 SKUs that can overclock, that's simply amazing. Second, when it comes to overclocking Sapphire Rapids, the experience is very similar to previous high-end desktop CPUs. It certainly doesn't feel as nimble as how it is on a mainstream desktop, but it's still impressive that you can get quite a bit of extra performance out of your Xeon Sapphire Rapids. Okay, the 400 megahertz extra in a 1T workload isn't that impressive, but when we look at the all-core overclock, that's a different story. We went from 3.3 gigahertz for all 24 cores to 4.9 gigahertz for all 24 cores. That's an increase of 1.6 gigahertz. And if we look at the benchmarks, we see that the performance is equally, or the performance increase is equally impressive. Now, there's still a lot to dig into when it comes to Sapphire Rapids, and I hope to do that in future videos. I definitely want to try one of those multi-tile die CPUs of the W3400 series. Anyway, that's it for this video. I want to thank you for watching, and I want to thank the patrons for the support. As per, as per usual, I will put a written version of this video up on my blog if you want to read through the settings or have a closer look at the benchmark results. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section below and see you next time.